Welcome. How's the first day of Q going so far? We are here to talk, not just ourselves to talk with you, but to give you an opportunity to discuss and share your ideas about how we can really focus on education as not just filling a pail, but lighting a fire in our students, and specifically in our, our young women students and their desire to be um, focused on STEAM, um, which is pretty exciting. So my name is Rebecca Gerard, and I teach at Notre Dame High School, which is in Belmont, California, up in the Bay Area. I teach biology and AP biology, and I also get to work with faculty on tech integration. And my colleagues here, I have to give a big shout out and thanks to because I submitted a proposal to Q, got accepted, and then said, you wanna come with me? And now we're on the big stage, so yay! <laughs> Little bit of tech instigating um, for them, but they're amazing, and they're gonna tell you about themselves. Hi, I'm Mi Nguyen. Um, I am... Uh, a science lover and enthusiast. I used to work in biotech for about six and seven years before I got to education. I've been in education for six years now, and I love it. I get to work with really passionate girls and passionate educators, um, and it's really inspired me to want to inspire young women to continue on the pursuit of science as well. Hi everyone, my name is Christy Chun, and I am a high school science teacher. This is my third year teaching science um, at Notre Dame High School in Belmont. We're a private all-girls Catholic school, um, and I'm just so excited to be here. This is my first time presenting at Q and my first time at the Q conference, so I'm really excited, and I'm looking forward to a great adventure. Hi, my name is Dewana Aldrich. I'm the outcast of the group. I teach across the bay in Oakland at an all-girls high school called Holy Names High School. I'm a science teacher. I've been teaching at Holy Names for seven years, and if it's life science, it's my department. Dewana says that she's the outcast. I've been joking that I'm the one of these things that's not like the other, because I'm not a science teacher. I am a former social science teacher, and I am now an administrator, but I am the administrator for these three fabulous, fabulous teachers. So I feel like I'm just kind of along for the ride today. Uh, so welcome. Um, Anne here ignites our passion for learning. Uh, so I love that we actually started with Brad and his discussion on what is it that really pushed everyone to be here today. If you're here today, that means you are inspired and you really care about education and you're here to promote education in young people, uh, for us young women. And so at some point, a lot of us lose that um, edge and we lose that passion and we lose all of kind of the motivation to do that. And so, like Brad, I had a lot of experiences that really pushed me to continue on with science. And around eighth grade, I started, okay, I'm not sure if I'm interested, but my ninth grade honors biology teacher was phenomenal. I don't even know if she was four feet tall, and she commanded the classroom. She would get up there and you're like, oh, cells? I love cells. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure, I'll learn that. And whatever you did, whatever mistake you made, she was like, whatever. Okay, what'd you get wrong? And it really inspired me to be like, okay, science is something that I can do and focus on and get wrong and still learn with. So now, not only is my fire lit, but it continues to be growing because I work with these amazing educators who challenge me every day, who inspire me to do better in my class and for my students. And my students, they just ask the best questions and I want to encourage them to learn. So today we ask you, really, how old were you when you had a positive experience, not only with science, but with education that caused you or that allowed you to pursue education, and really who has influenced you. So if you can turn to a partner, a neighbor, someone behind you if you're not sitting next to one. I know teachers tend to sit away from each other because we're like, no kids, that means we can be by ourselves for a little bit, but if we can pull in and kind of talk to each other, that would be wonderful. So please, share an experience with someone. So since emotions are something that really seemed like a common, a common theme that I was hearing, you know, how someone made us feel or how someone um, interacted with us, that connection. Um, really our day-to-day our -day connections are things that can have a huge impact on our lives. Um, so we're just gonna watch a quick video clip. Sammy, sweetie, don't get your dress dirty. Sammy, 
him, honey, you don't want to mess with that. Let's put him down. Samantha, this product has gotten out of control. Whoa, hey, careful with that. Why don't you hand that to your brother? Our words can have a huge impact. Isn't it time we told her she's pretty brilliant too? Encourage her love of science and technology and inspire her to change the world. That's a pretty powerful video from Verizon talking about girls in general, but overall, our words impacting. What we'd like to do is take that thought and look at this question above you, or above me. Why does the passion for science tend to wane in young girls during middle school and high school? And we'd like you to think about that just a moment, and then we want you to pick up the pink hexagons that you'll find scattered, and we're using pink on purpose for the girls, and we'd like you to put down your thoughts. Obviously, the hexagons are small, so that means not sentences. It just means phrases, single words. What are your thoughts on this? And we'll give you a moment to do that. And feel free to share the, the pink hexagons around. Um, if you want to move in from some of the back um, seats to come and, and join in, um, feel free to do that as well. Okay, you, we're hoping that you have one or two thoughts down on your hexagons. What we'd like you to do is take your hexagon and share your ideas with other people. And if you have similar things, this is hexagon building and we use it in the classroom. And what we would like you to do is connect your hexagons. So if you have similar ideas, similar thoughts, you put the edges of the hexagons together and you kind of see a common thread typically. If you want to stand up and move over to where someone is, Q is a phenomenal place to meet other passionate educators. Yeah. Kid president would say, be awesome, right? Try something new. I see a few people are building on the floor. Yes. That's great. Would you raise your hand if any of the ideas that you see up on the screen are some of those that came to your mind? Some of you might recognize this one.
Doesn't that look more fun? It's the kind of way we, the, the four of us, teach with our girls. Since we all four teach at two all-girls high schools, we work hard to find ways to make it fun and relevant. Yeah, and that definitely looks like a joyful rebellion to me, right? We talked about that this morning. Um, and how we can find ways, all of us as educators, to help our students feel that way. And they can be joyful rebellion against those ideas that I was uh, hearing from a couple of people. Kindergartner teacher, they love science. They just don't know. They can't do it. They keep doing it. They love it. And then eighth grade teacher, oh, my girls tell me they're just not good at math and science. Oh, I'm just not good at that. And so what happens? What happens at that point? So there's different things that motivate our students at each different stage of development. And we want to take a chance to have you first talk with people who know your developmental stage, who teach in the same kind of topic area, or not topic area, the same age range. And then we're going to come back and mix up a little bit more. So we just had lunch, and it's nice and warm and dark in here. So we're going to ask you to stand up. And um, if K through twos can be the first groups in each aisle, so find your K through two people, first groups in three, each aisle, then it's three through five, and then six through eight, and then high school, and if we have anyone who's higher education. So just kind of find your people kind of along the, the aisleways where you can kind of group up and share that idea of, so what motivates your students at that developmental age where they are? And we're only going to take a you know, couple minutes, three minutes here, and then you'll go back to your, your spaces where you can also talk with other people. And there will be some bleed you know, between K2 and the others, and just kind of, you know, what really motivates your, your students at that, at that age? Okay, so if you all could just take a minute, pick up your blue hexagons, and go ahead and write down some of the thoughts that came out of that conversation that you all just had. Okay, so at this time, um, you should have your pink and your blue hexagons with maybe words, phrases, ideas that were generated um, through reflecting on the videos and the discussions that you've been having. Um, and I'd kind of like you to take a, a take a second look at the the ideas and the concepts and the kind of the the big things that were sparked. Um, and as you start to form connections amongst your pink and blue hexagons, remember we kind of like to say connections are, are shown visually by placing the hexagons next to each other so their, their sides are, are touching actually. So any hexagons that are adjacent to each other will say that there's a reason for that and you're going to kind of want to think through your own reasoning behind those connections. Um, and so as we kind of reflect on, on how the pink and blue hexagons um, are connecting, I think we're going to ask that you think about um, those connections in this context, um, this idea of how we can create um, a culture that both nurtures and empowers um, young women and, and young children to pursue science. Um, so we ask that you take maybe a minute to look through your ideas and reflect on the discussions and the videos um, that you've seen and consider responses to this question um, based off of kind of what's come up so far. And as you brainstorm ideas, the next thing we're going to ask you to do, I feel like we're asking you to do, to do a lot, but you're doing so well at it. So we're going to keep asking you to um, um, participate again. If you um, log on to this link, you're actually going to get access to something called Answer Garden. Um, and I'd like you to record maybe a word or a phrase um, that responds this idea of how you think a culture can be created um, that'll both empower and inspire young women and children in science. Um, so this link should get you to um, the web page. And if some of you are familiar with Padlet, this is actually kind of a, a version of that same idea. Um, so go ahead and, and respond to this question. Um, and as we collect your responses, we'll be able to, to show you on the big screen. So go ahead and take about a minute to kind of collect your thoughts. And a word or a phrase will do to respond to this question. Uh, 
Okay, so if you notice um, on the side screens there, those are the results of um, your thoughtful responses. And if you notice, there's actually different size words. Um, so kind of based on the size of the word, that's kind of um, correlated to the, the frequency of that response. Um, so the, the words that are in larger um, font types, those are the responses that we recorded that were, were most common. Um, so this is kind of a, a quick way to visually collect and, and get instant feedback from all of you. So thank you for sharing these, these thoughtful ideas. So one of the things that I forgot to do at the very start was ask who we have in the room. And we got sort of a visual when you all got up to talk, but just really quickly by show of hands, how many of you are K2? Okay, how many of you are 3-5? Six, eight. High school? A lot of high school, nice. How many people in this room are administrators as well? Or that's what you do. Okay, so just a few. All right, so this, this next question, how can we incorporate a spirit of exploration throughout education? This is something that all of us have to think about. And while there are only a few administrators in the room, I'm definitely talking to you, but I'm talking to all of you because the fact that you are here and the fact that your school invested the time and the funds to send you here says that you've got somewhere somebody is somewhat supportive or you're just really good at muscling your way to awesome conferences. Either way, if you could get yourself here, you can take this message back. We heard Brad this morning talking to us about the joyful revolution. We also heard him talking to us about the need to remind kids that each of them matters, right? So that's our job. That's my job as an administrator, is to let these educators know that they matter so that they can then go into the classroom and let those kids know that they matter. That phrase that we were told this morning just fits so perfectly. We need to be the people for those kids that we needed at their age. So as you think about incorporating a spirit of exploration throughout education, we want to, I mean, the whole purpose of this is not just about science or about math. We don't have any robots up here for engineering, for tech strands. It's the idea of making it a more inclusive model. And that A in STEAM, the arts, is what is so important and what we as educators of young women have found to be that connecting link. So making it more inclusive, more creative, is really gonna speak to our kids. And those of you that are in uh, co-ed classrooms, boys get super fun and creative too. I have a nine-year-old nine son and he loves being creative, loves it. He loves to draw pictures, he loves making up songs. He'll ask me, did you like that song, mom? He'll sit there and dance, really like kid president. The way, that's just the way kids think. That's that curiosity, that exploration, that slowly, as we've been talking, gets taken away from kids as we pull out the creative piece as we throw in things like accelerated reader. Yes, right, I know about these things. Standardized testing, AP exams, right? You have to sit, you have to get the right answer, and there's no room for extra fun. But what, what would a world look like? How would education look if we could keep exploration as the central focus for everything, right? Those girls that in the, um, the Goldie Blocks commercial, how much fun was that? And think of all the math and science they had to figure out to turn off the TV. They could have just gotten up and turned it off, but they didn't, right? That's what we want our kids to be doing. We want that joyful revolution in our classes all the time. So what can you do? How can you take something back to your classroom to make it more creative, to make it more inclusive, to spark that imagination? What do you need from your colleagues, right? From your team teachers. What do you need from your administrators? How can we support you? What do you need from your district? This is your time to dream big. How might we create a better world by educating our kids differently, by speaking to all of them and letting them excel to their greatest potential? That's really what we want to get at. So we're going to ask you to take a couple of minutes, again, to think about this question. And this is going to go on your green hexagon. So take, again, just a couple minutes, think about it. If you want to talk with your neighbor as you're writing, and just, just think. 
Uh, we were talking in the back, and um, one of the things that came up, somebody mentioned their robotics club and the success that they had. And I've noticed that that very novel situation has created a very level playing field. Uh, and it's, it's empowering to the boys and the girls equally in a way that doesn't really shut either one of them down. Uh, and I've seen my girls um, do amazing things. Uh, and, and frankly, their, their work is much higher quality. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and, and you, but they haven't been able to, they weren't able to do, at, do that until they um, could get to the point where they were confident. Uh, and in that environment where they see the boys and it's new to them, um, sort of change the game a little bit. There are some amazing educators out there all across the country and the world. All you have to do is find them and then take their stuff, modify it for what you need, your curriculum, and you have something brand new to introduce, and that brings the novelty back into the classroom. Yeah. And I think we have some slides to share some of the things that we've tried um, really to, to get that feeling of exploration in the classroom for everyone. Um, we have the opportunity to work with all girls in our classrooms, which I really value for me um, because it's kind of a novelty for them. They've been with boys all the way until ninth grade, um, and all of a sudden they have more freedom to have that confidence to kind of be who they are. They wear uniforms, which makes things a little easier too, <laughs> I feel. Um, but it really is exciting to have a room full of students where they all know they have to do, right? They can't let someone else do it, they've got to do it. Um, we've got a new robotics program at our school, and uh, that's been a game changer, similar to what Adam was sharing. That's been really a game changer. That's with boys, our robotics team uh, works with boys. This is a fun project I do in AP Biology where they have to do this high level by technology, you gotta take a jellyfish gene and insert it into bacteria and get the bacteria to grow and you gotta learn about plasmids and operons and antibiotic resistance and blah, 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 blah. And what do we do? Well, we make art out of it. <laughs> and the girls have to then explain, well, how were you able to make some glow and some not glow? And it was cute because they make happy faces and butterflies and hearts and, and eyeballs and stuff. It was really fun. But that's high level content with art in it. Art's been a really big connector, and I know that's been the same with the other, other teachers here. We have a couple more examples of art really bringing in that science, um, technology, engineering, and math. We do a lot of art and hands-on, and again, um, a lot of the girls who get to our classes are sometimes like, You're, you guys do a lot of art in a science class. And we're like, yeah, it, science is really artistic. And there's a lot of hands-on components to it. And, and it's not just memorizing. It's kind of making these analogies, coming up with models, really understanding what things look like. How can I create that? And um, we really have this area that's open for design that encourages them to learn and be artistic and show other people what they do. And then they share out a lot. And I think it's most important for girls to know that this is not an area where you can get something right or wrong. You can be wrong all the time. And um, I think that is really nice to go on with science because in science, it's a goal to be wrong. So you can kind of figure out what went wrong and how it went wrong and why it went wrong. So our um, topic really lends its hand to that, but they aren't scared to be wrong, which is nice. And so it really allows room for growth and learning and encouraging them to explore and be like, oh, well, that's wrong. So then why it's wrong? And it's what we really try to do in our classrooms on a daily basis. This is a, a new lesson that I designed um, over the summer and gave to my students to do, and they used a video mashup of Shut Up and Dance with Me to study articulations. You know how boring bones and joints can be? They can be really boring sometimes when you're studying them. So we started off with a crime scene, and I gave them a bunch of dead bone or dead bodies, all that was left with bones. And they had to first I put that all together, come up with who they were. There were only four sets of bones, but there were six missing people. So they had to come up with who these missing people were. And then we went into articulations, which are the joints in the classroom. They learned to dance. They took a segment of that, ended up understanding the movement of the joint, and then prototyped it by using what I call stuff. And they made movable joints out of just household supplies. After they did that, they got introduced to a 3D program called Tinkercad with Autodesk, and Autodesk was really happy to help 
They're in, based in San Francisco. And they helped guide my students along who ended up 3D printing bones and joints. The goal was you have to make it move like the joint is supposed to move. They had a blast. It took forever to do. But they went from one step to the next step, always excited because it was going to be new and creative, something different. But do you want to bring up that really important point of it took forever. And I think that's a challenge, you know, when, when we're teaching in the younger grades, it seems like we can do more creative things and have more of that time. But as you get into middle school, they're looking at, I've got to get them into high school. And then they're in high school, I've got to get them into college. And then someone takes care of them after that. But how do we, how do we balance that? I have to do all this thing for my time and I really want this to be creative and fun and have novelty and have the students do all of this artwork and, and this one's amazing. This one's incredible. But it takes the time. It does take time. This is AP Biology studying cell transportation. And it, the criteria is that they have to understand the components of a cell membrane. And then they have to understand all the aspects of cellular diffusion. This does take time. But when they're done piecing this together, and they're done doing the intense drawing and the detailed drawing, they understand it. They understand it fully. We put it up in the classroom. I have my biology students standing there looking at it. They like it and they want to know, why can't we do this too? Well, they get to when they get to AP Biology. I don't let them do it at that point because they can look at it, they understand it, but they don't understand it to the same degree. These are the joints that my students made. Without, uh, these are all primitives to start with, primitive geometric shapes that they pieced together. They learned how to carve into appropriate bone shapes. And you can see they're kind of rough edges. They had to end up sanding them. Then they had to figure out, do they move properly? If not, they had to rebuild and they got a second print. This is my freshman class. My freshman class learning to use 3D designing. And they also built their own prototypes. And they pro um, produced these as their beginning prototypes and then advanced the curriculum a little bit further. This is also an AP biology class, another one of mine, um, studying cell organelles and also studying them to scale. So you, what you can see is a water vacuole in a nucleus. What you can't see is a piece of cell membrane, a Golgi apparatus, and a mitochondrion. They were all built to scale, scale by my AP students, and then my biology students reap the benefits of what's there, because they can see it as well. And art is one big piece of, of what I've really, we've all tried to incorporate in getting our girls uh, creatively uh, engaging in that STEM. And for us, with uh, the young women that we work with, we found that that's really important for them. It's important for, for both genders, um, but it's really important for them to have that connection. And sometimes that can be hard in a classroom, especially in co-ed classrooms where people aren't necessarily as comfortable to raise their hand and speak out. Um, but using things like discussion boards, this is where technology can really benefit, especially those quieter students. Discussion boards, using a back channel during lectures or when you're watching a video. Um, we have started creating digital portfolios where students get to share, not just with me, they get to share with the world. Talk about upping the game on their work. Um, it's incredible what they produce when they know everyone's looking at it. Um, making with media and using social media in positive ways and, and letting the students blog. It's about them sharing their feelings and emotions and getting connected to the scientific topic. And these are just some more ideas that we've used. Uh, we like to get guest speakers on campus um, as often as possible. Um, so we do a big, and again, it kind of depends on the resources your school has and the different things you have, but guest speakers are someone that you can just always invite in and have people come from anywhere. We do a biotechnology unit where the girls get to pretend to be genetic counselors. We learn about genetic diseases. They research things. And right now, with all these different things, they know things in their family. They're like, oh, my friend has this. Oh, I, this runs in my family. So they get to research and really look at the things that they're interested in. The more you can connect it, especially to girls' lives, the more they're invested in learning. And so we have a genetic counselor come in, and she comes and she talks about what she does. You open their eyes to different career goals. We have women in that field. You talk about, oh, they work with this. You're showing them that these are jobs that are not available yet, 
But if you continue to study, they will be available and you can be the ones pioneering these jobs for yourself, which is incredible and it's really empowering for them. Uh, we have a sports medicine class and she really sets up different internship opportunities for the girls where they're in the field in the Bay Area working uh, with people in physical therapy, different places, learning about sports medicine, very hands-on, lots of labs, pretending to wrap each other's feet and it really makes them feel engaged and like they're a part of their learning. Oh yeah, and when, whenever possible getting the girls or the students outside to experience their world. We can bring the world into the classroom in so many amazing ways now with technology, with videos, with um, uh, webinars, with Skype calls. Brad was mentioning that this morning. He's Skype calling into fourth grade classrooms. I'm like, oh, I wish I taught fourth grade. It'd be awesome. Um, but also getting the students to go out either as a group together or actually having students go out and explore their backyards. Go explore your backyard, take a couple pictures, then come in and tell us what you've discovered in your backyard. Um, or, you know, go you talk about cars with someone and tell me about those cars. I mean, finding ways to get the kids to connect their real life to what we're learning is, I think, the real, like, big key. Um, mm -hmm. I think a big role um, that these connections and role models and opportunities and encouragement play is the formation of these young women's you know, identity and the, the people that they're growing into. And I think big pieces of identity are going to depend on the social interactions that they get along with the scaffolding that they're going to get to not only socialize and become confident about their voice in the science disciplines, but also to become you know, socialized and confident and develop their voice as global citizens beyond the class and I think in order to develop their identity, they are going to need, you know, that additional support and scaffolding, but also they're going to need these authentic, um, creative opportunities to be able to produce and, and reflect on their own abilities. Um, and hopefully, as educators, we're able to, you know, play even just a little piece in that puzzle. Um, and I think that that's a big reason why, you know, we do what we do every day, so... We had to throw this in because it's convenient that this conference is happening during Women's History Month. So when you get our uh, a slide deck, you'll also get a whole slew of resources that were recently put out by KQED uh, for Women's History Month. So just an extra little bonus because it's March. Um, this is actually an example of something that the chemistry teachers um, at our school tried to do. So I was collaborating with um, my department chair and we had this idea of, hey, let's try to bring in a little bit of this idea of allowing our girls to create some art in the chemistry classroom by forming words um, that, that had meaning to them based off of the elements on the periodic table. Um, so this is a great example of, of a word spelled by elements. I also saw words like chocolate, so I guess that would be what? carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. But this really gave, gave the girls a chance to link what we were talking about regarding elements on the periodic table to words in, in their own lives that meant something to them. So not only did they you know, express that they could show the, the molecular mass of their word, but they also explained to us why that word was significant to them. So this was kind of the, the introduction to how we helped them to see connections between their personal lives and something like the periodic table. Um, so it was a fun assignment and they got to make their own shirts and they wore them on mole day, which is um, October 23rd, so. Okay, so at this point you have a few hexagons or maybe you've just kind of focused on discussion or putting things on the answer garden. We wanted to go low tech and tech um, in ways to discuss, um, but we also want to open it up for a chance for if anyone wants to share something or has a question um, for us or you can just share with someone nearby. So what's been perfect about this whole conference for me is that while I'm here, my children have had their science projects on display at their science fair back home. And that Verizon commercial hit probably hardest because I have a, a third grade son and a kindergarten daughter. And about, I don't know, an hour ago I got a text from my dad that the school had called panic because my daughter won an award in the science fair, and so she doesn't know yet. So it's what I, I, I look at her now, and I watch stuff like that, and I know that we can do better, we have to do better, and we will do better, because if she's gonna win an award in kindergarten, imagine what she can do in, in, in the future. And I'm, I'm a science teacher who was pulled from the science classroom, put into technology, 
And I started incorporating science into my technology classes because it is that important. And our STEAM fair is coming up, first annual, April 21st. And that's the piece too of that interdisciplinary piece that you mentioned, how we can bring technology and science and art and we actually call it stream because we teach at a religious school. So we have religion in with all of it. It's gonna get longer and longer, right? Streaming along down the road. We'll have this big long thing. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts you want to discuss with each other? Um, do you guys have any suggestions on how you can create a buy-in with staff if your staff's and things they could be doing more tangibly instead of worksheets or whatever some cling to? So my first question back to you, do you have a supportive administration? And do you have at least one other teacher who has the same vision as you do? Okay, so if you have a supportive administration and you have one other person that you can partner with, that makes it so much easier because you've got a team. And for right now, what I would say to you is don't think about what's happening in the classroom next door. You gotta think about what's happening with your kids. And as the parents hear what's happening in your classroom, they're gonna be putting pressure to have more teachers like you so that more kids can have that experience. Um, and then as your kids, what grade do you teach? You teach second, okay, so as your kids move on to third grade, if your parents have seen what a great time the kids have had and how successful they have been, they will start asking, well, who in third grade is gonna pick this up and continue on? And as the kids themselves are talking about, oh my gosh, we did the coolest thing yesterday in class, and your administration is showing support and acknowledging maybe at a faculty meeting or when you guys do your PD days or whatever, start having them showcase one or two cool things that are going on. Other teachers are gonna be saying, well, how come she's getting all the attention? And it will start to create that buy-in slowly but surely. It is not easy. It, it takes time, but that's why I have, if you've got another partner in crime, it helps because now you guys become the cool club and you'll, you'll start getting others. But you really have to think about what you're doing for your kids. You know there are so many other kids out there and it's heartbreaking that they're not getting it, but slowly the pendulum shifts. You just gotta stick with it. Okay. So I teach an elective class, so girls aren't required to take it to graduate, and so I wanna know how I can increase enrollment. How do I get them into the class if they're not required to take it, how do I balance it out so it's not, you know, at, at the moment I've probably got 10 girls out of 150, 180 students, and as long as it stays that low, there's no real incentive to, for more girls to sign up. So what, what can I do to increase enrollment in an elective? So, and teachers feel free to jump in, but what I would suggest for that scenario, because we all have that, and especially when you're dealing with small student populations, how do you get them interested in taking the classes that we know they need to take? Because it's what's right for their futures. The kids that are in the class right now, do they have pretty good buy-in for what you're doing with that elective? Okay, so if the kids have good buy-in, you turn them into your ambassadors. I'm not sure how your scheduling process works, but if there's a way to get your kids into the grade below them to go and talk about how awesome this class was, or if you can get your kids to um, go and talk to your counselors, if you've got a counseling staff to help encourage them, you know what, yeah, we know it's a not an A to G requirement for college or whatever, but it's a great class and here's why, and you should encourage other kids to take it. Um, also maybe uh, if you have the ability which you, I would hope that most schools have this ability now, and if you don't, let's figure out another way to do it. Get, a, get them to do a little short uh, public service announcement for the class and stick it on the website so the parents can see it. And get them saying, oh gosh, honey, how come you're not thinking about taking that class? That looks really interesting. So just using, using the tools that you've got to expand the, the excitement about it, maybe they could do a quick lunchtime demonstration about something cool that they learned in class so the other kids get a little bit curious. I know it's hard, it's, it's so, so hard to get kids. We have a coding class and we get four girls to sign up for it. 
but we keep running it because it's so important. And in time, hopefully it will become more important if the UC system ever says that coding is actually an important language, but we'll get there. You high school people know what I'm talking about. Um, so that's, yeah, I, to I feel your pain because we have a lot of electives in that same boat. But using your kids that are in there, that have the buy-in, to be the ambassadors for you, talk to them. Hey guys, what can we do to get your friends to take this class next year? See what they come up with. So that, that's where I would start. I teach an elective class as well, and I think what I've noticed this year is that when kids hear elective, they think easy. And I'm like, mm, it's a science elective, so it's a science class that you elect to take, therefore you want to take it. Um, so I think I have a little bit of that. It's an elective. I want you to take it because you want to take it, not because you have to take it. And how I deal with that is I go in class and I make it the best class I can every day. And I'm up there and I'm standing on my head and I'm dancing and I'm encouraging and I'm doing all the things that I love and I'm passionate about. I'm bringing in things about education, I mean about the environment. I bring in environmental factors. I bring in guest speakers. We do field trips. We um, do anything that I can relate. Uh, I teach environmental science, so it's very relatable. So anything that I can connect to their lives and get them interested and engaged. And again, like Anne said, you get your students to say, you should take this class, you should take this class. And I think when they like it, they will. I also have amazing colleagues who do science placement and uh, Christy will be like, oh, ah, you're going to be great in environmental science. I think that's the class for you. So you get your colleagues to tell their girls to take your class or your students, and it works. And so every year we're like, oh, you kind of like bones? Anatomy it is. Sports med you should take and really encourage them because sometimes they don't know it's available to them. I teach kindergarten, and I am implementing a coding club with um, my students and also after school. So I think it's really something we have to start it from the ground up. We have to, we talked about it in our group there, that it really is important when they don't know the difference between boys and girls and the potential and the limits and anything, that we really drive it in and get the buy-in then. So, um, you know. I, re I use donors choose to ask for money. I've gotten tons of things funded that way so that I can get, uh, get them to my children and get the parents to buy in with their kids' enthusiasm and then it spreads to more kids and now it's spreading to more schools. So it's just... They cannot be what they do not see. And that's so important for them to remember and to know. And just that there's so much hope, because I so agree with that. You know, all of you who are teaching in the younger grades, it's going to trickle up. And I'm excited, because they're going to trickle up to us, and it's just going to be awesome. Look at how many of us are here talking about this topic. How are we going to ignite that passion for STEM or STEAM or STREAM in our young women especially? And if we are all this passionate about this topic, we are going to make that difference. That's really exciting. I actually gave myself chills. Oh, oh that's so exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming. We do have a link in our presentation that has a whole bunch of other, it's got the, the videos that we showed and a couple other articles and things that really talk about young girls and, and STEM and STEAM. Um, and we also have a link to the evaluation um, so that you can help give us some feedback on, on how we can continue to present and ignite the passion for STEAM in everyone. Yay. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your Q visit.